Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to introduce the winner of the Bruce Matthews Lifetime Achievement Award. This award is presented to an individual or organization that, over the span of a lifetime, has provided steadfast leadership, outstanding service, and continuous commitment to the machine golf industry. The award is named after the first award recipient, Mr. Matthews, whose expertise you can see spread throughout the fairways of Michigan. Original thought, stick to itness, courage, determination are just a few of the adjectives that describe today's recipient. Uh, from humble beginnings as school teacher in Northern Michigan to the architect and leader of the world's largest golf tournament, the Oldsmobile Scramble, it's a story we can all learn from and respect. Golf has been a part of Dick Narn's life since he started as a caddy at the age of 11. And from, a caddy, from the caddy shack uh, to high school and college golf, Dick was an active participant with a low handicap and a nagging idea that there was a place for every golfer in a tournament that could be both challenging and fun. He was right. Dick did not waver in his resolve to create something new and unique within golf. Though it took him 13 years to launch the scramble, patience, persistence, and a strong belief in his objective ultimately prevailed. And if one needs convincing, let's just say that in pursuit of his goal, he visited more than 5,000 golf courses, and before it was over, some 2 million golfers were direct beneficiaries of his vision. Though Dick and the scramble had crossed paths with my dad and he in the past, my first interaction with Dick uh, was two years ago as we did back-to-back -back presentations for this very group. Uh, and what I've learned since is that within Dick, the creative fire still burns. So I'm proud to introduce, and the Michigan Golf Course Owners Association recognizes and celebrates the lifetime achievements in golf by our good friend, Mr. Dick Carr. It's a two-minute speech. Wow. Gotta take pictures? Yeah. Get the wide thing on. It's always good to turn it on. There you go. Thank you. All right, my guys. All right. It's all yours. Last time that the Stu and I did that was a couple years ago, and he came up and kind of introduced me, and uh, I proceeded to faint dead away about halfway through this talk. So. That happens again today, just stay out of the way. Let me pull. <laughs> One of the things about the old, by the way, I want to thank everybody that allowed me to have this honor. I, I love golf. Everything about golf has been just great to me. And uh, one of the questions that uh, people come up with is how did you ever get something like the old mill scramble started? Because it is an unusual animal as I found out over the years. First of all, most of the uh, uh, companies have a policy that they do not accept uh, guys like me to do business with them. You have to go through their agency to get in the door with most of the companies. Well, that's very hard to do because they're set up to screen you out so they get all the business and you don't get it. So just imagine if you are a 400 and 40 pound, no lie, school teacher from Northern Michigan, and I'm walking into the avenues of America down in New York City, say, hey, you wanna buy a golf tournament? <laughs> it did, you know, I don't think they really took me seriously. We sent out that year uh, 560 Mission Possible kits. Remember the Mission Impossible thing? It used to be a television show, so we made up these little kits and we put everything into a briefcase and we sent them out to everybody. 560 of them, I think. We got 554 no's. We got six people that allow us to come in and make a presentation. So that, that's where, that's what you have to start with. Think about, think about that and think about the intimidation that goes along with trying to, you know, uh, not have any background in promotion whatsoever or advertising or any of that kind of thing. You go up against the biggest people in the world, people who do the Olympics or 
people that do the NCAA or, you know, those kinds of things. Those were the people I was competing with. So that was, that was kind of, it was very different to me once I got into the business and then perceiving the business. So I want to just tell a few stories about how this happened and, and just give you a little bit of insight uh, uh, as to uh, how it hit me. Um, first of all, I started out as a school teacher. I taught school for about nine years on and off. And I wasn't making enough money to pay the bills. I was about a thousand dollars short every year from taking care of my family. So I had to do something else. And so I decided to become a coast to coast truck driver. The year I became a coast to coast truck driver, uh, I made uh, almost $13,000 more than the last year I did teaching school. So I was able to uh, pay for a lot of bills and stuff. Well, when I was a coast to coast truck driver, uh, my whole job was not to uh, plan on that for a career, but to use that time to think about all the things I could do to, you know, to get a business going, to, to uh, uh, run a business. So I'm driving, I'm, I'm headed out of Holland, Michigan. This is no lie. Heinz Warehouse in Holland, Michigan. In fact, I think it was a factory where they made dill pickles. And I was taking a load of pickles on the way to uh, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I was gonna put them in their warehouse down there in Pennsylvania. <laughs> About halfway down there on that trip, I got the idea of the Ozenville Scramble. And I went absolutely berserk. I jumped up and down and my, my tractor had a, uh, uh, air seat in it, and I was jumping up and down in my tractor on that air seat. And, and the other drivers that went by me looked at me like I was crazy. And I was crazy. I said, I can do this. I can run the world's largest golf tournament. Now, you got to remember, I knew nothing about anything about promotion. I knew the format because Ed Karczewski, who was at Traverse City Golf and Country Club, who was a uh, pro there during the years I caddied and stuff, introduced me to the scramble format, which was uh, developed during the depression when they didn't have enough uh, people paying for golf. They would get 10 cents around for a round of golf, and that's how the scramble got started, way back in the 30s. At least that's Ed's story to me, of how that got started. <coughs> so that's all I knew about. I knew the scramble format, and I also knew that every every time there was a big uh, day for a round of golf, like a uh, oh the Fourth uh, of July or something, he would have 36 fivesomes sign up and play in the scramble that day. They loved that tournament so much, and I found out in my own inevitable way why they liked it so much. The, the head golfer, the, the best guy on the team liked it because he, get, he got to show off for everybody else. <laughs> and make no, make, they all love it. I, I've checked this out with the best guys in the world that, that, that know how to check out why people do things. That's why they did it. The second best golfer, what do you think they thought? They secretly thought they were better than the first golfer. <laughs> and if you ask the second best golfer in any round of golf, uh, why they were playing or who they were playing. They knew exactly how many times their shot had been ch chosen as a chosen shot in the scramble. <laughs> oh, I, how many times, you know, how many uh, shots were they? All the way, you used 13, but almost 14. You really got to make it 13 and a half. So, so I learned that there was a passion about this tournament. There really was a passion about it. And I said, that passion has got to be transferable. Now, the scramble was not ubiquitous at that time. It wasn't everywhere. It was only in certain places and certain clubs. And I, I, had, I sort of had the responsibility to go out and introduce it to those clubs that didn't yet have it, you know, have the scramble done. So it was a very interesting time. And I literally went, and I'm not gonna tell you all of the stuff I did, but I, I literally went to about 5,000 golf courses. I would knock on their door, and this is before I had the PGA of America involved. I would knock on their door, and I'd say, hey, you wanna run a scramble golf tournament? 
and and 95 percent of the people turned me down because i didn't understand god i didn't even understand how important like the mpcoa was or or the uh pga of america or those kind of guys and i finally started going to the pga merchandise show i think that was about 1980 1979 something like that and I got to find out that without the uh, PGA of America, I probably wasn't gonna get the right sponsor. And so I did the stuff I needed to do to find out how to make them interested. Once I got them interested, I was able to uh, uh, get the uh, GM interested. And when I got GM interested, everybody was interested. It was so funny. When I'd go out and I would talk to uh, Walt Disney World or I'd talk to the PGA of America before I had a sponsor, as I, uh, yeah, who are you? Dick Garn, and I, yeah, well, what you got? I got a golf tournament. I was, oh, okay, see you sometime if you ever get a sponsor. The year I got, the, the very first year I got a sponsor, it was like I was their best buddy. I was out on their yachts, I was on their airplanes, I was every, it was, it was just like night and day different. So you have to have a sponsor to have a major uh, event like the Oldsmobile Scramble take, take off. You have to have someone, and it's not just the money. The money is essential, don't get me wrong. But it's also the reputation that they have. If you're, if you're a partner with GM, everybody assumes that you know what you're doing. Well, I got through that as best I could. Obviously, I didn't know what I was doing. By the way, I didn't have any family money. I didn't have any uh, uh, connection to golf courses. I didn't have any connection with golf manufacturing. I simply knew Ed Karczewski and I knew uh, how to caddy and that was basically what I knew. By the way, uh, anybody want to guess how much I made caddying in those days? 75 cents was for a B caddy, which I, when I started out, that's what I got. And Mrs. Thoroughby, who was the local doctor's wife, used to give me seven, 75 cents to two pieces of gum. The gum <laughs> being my uh, tip. So, um, that, was the, that was the summer of 1971 that I, I had that epiphany. And I never know if I'm saying that word right. Is that the right way to say that? You got it. It sounds wrong almost the other way, doesn't it? So anyway, I had the epiphany that I could get everybody to play in a, in a national uh, golf tournament, um, and, and I had to go out and then find a sponsor and, and do all that work. Um, By the way, I was on, uh, that was a big, my big rig was on Ohio US 23 uh, going uh, uh, eastbound. And, um, and I wanted to let you know that because I know that was just pressing hard on your mind. <laughs> and, uh, and, and having a load of pickles on too is kind of neat, isn't it? To remember that. In fact, it says right here in my notes that are hamburger dills. <laughs> so you, you know that. And, and the jumping up and down, think of the jumping up and down as there was a seat under me, and think of the torture they were taking for this 440 pound guy jumping up and down. The seat thing, yeah, I want you to remember because this comes into my story a little bit more. So, one of the four or six uh, companies that would allow me to come in and make a, a uh, pitch uh, turned out to be Buick. And Buick, uh, I, I went all the way from, uh, I think we were in Coldwater then, went from Coldwater to Chicago. I waited for three or four hours to talk to the guy from Buick. The guy from Buick turned me down in less than five minutes. And, I, you know, I thought that was just terribly rude of him to do that. And I sort of, you know, I sort of responded, you know, I didn't know how to respond because I'd taken all that time to go over there and see him. Well, anyway, uh, the rudeness paid off because on the way out the door, he said, you know what? He says, I, I don't think we got to use Ford at Buick, but Oldsmobile is just up the road in Lansing. Why don't you give them a call? And that's how I got into the Oldsmobile, and that's how I got the Oldsmobile.